afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, let me just point of correction. Um, my name is Kinsani Mabuza. I'm the Corporate Relations Executive at Zamani. And um, the reference we made earlier is actually something I'm quite proud of. It's the reference to the CEO, the group CEO, which is my mother, Mrs. Charmaine Mabuza. She was the first director on Whippold. Um, but she's the group CEO for the Zamani group of companies. And um, I'm going to chat to you guys about uh, sort of where the business is and how Zamani fits into the greater picture and where Mrs. Mabuza fits into this whole thing. She unfortunately couldn't be a part of um, today, but I think I will be well, I think I will represent her as well as I possibly can. Um, like I said, I work with the Corporate Relations Department um, for Zamani, which is the holding company for the South African National Lottery um, operator, Ituba. Uh, to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am from Nelspruit, a very small town, um, but I think we produce some great women. Yesterday I was on stage with um, Tepi Soposa. Uh, she's just finished writing and publishing her book. She's also from Nelspruit. We actually went to school together. Um, so I think Nelspruit is, is producing some great women. Um, I am a daughter of seven children, oh, wow. second uh, to last. Ooh, my apologies. Second to last born. Uh, so I had it tough. I competed with five brothers. I only have one sister. Um, all of them are entrepreneurs. All of them, um, you know, have, have succeeded in their industries. So we came in and I had to kind of, you know, kick the asses of my brothers a little bit and show them what's what. So thank you for having me today because I think this photo, please do take it. I need to send it to the family. We'll really, uh, <laughs> will help prove that point. Uh, before I start uh, speaking about the important role that corporate citizenship plays um, in building sustainable uh, development in Africa. I'd like to show you a one minute clip uh, just so I can introduce our group CEO and then you can also see where the money holdings as a company fits into the whole thing. Zamani Group of Companies is a black-owned company which is owned by the Mabuza family which was started as far back as 1990 and it's a private equity fund which specializes in startups. Amongst others, part of its asset is the Tuba, which is a, a lottery operations in South Africa. The next five years hold some exciting growth for ourselves. We would like to grow beyond South Africa into Africa, which is a very difficult terrain if you haven't been able to run companies within that space. Tuba's strategic focus for the year 2018 and 2019 for CSI has been about female development through our retailer development program as well as our Violence Against Women campaign. We've also focused on bridging the gap of education and unemployment through an internship, a youth development as well as a scholarship program this year. ITUBA stands for Equality and Opportunity. Therefore, it's important for us to contribute positively towards socio-economic de uh, development because not only do we offer South Africans the opportunity of self-enrichment through our product and product portfolio, but we also offer an opportunity through uh, the 27% of sales that we contribute uh, towards good causes uh, through the NLDTF, which is the National Lottery Distribution Trust Fund. Um, this means that we believe we've got to set standard and example for not only corporate South Africa but and Africa, but globally. So you see where I get my looks from? Yep. <laughs> my mother is, is gorgeous, thank you very much. And I'm so proud to be in a company that is led by a strong black African woman. It feels good and I think it sets a great example for everybody around me. Last week, uh, sorry, yesterday I actually mentioned that I run and manage a contingency or a department of 100% women. It makes me feel amazing, I can tell you that much. I'm with some of my team today, so thank you very much ladies for being here. Um, but I want us to go back to the reason why I'm on stage and why I want to speak to you guys today. Um, it really is about corporate citizenship and the role that we need to play in creating sustainable development, especially in empowering women in Africa. 
I think corporate citizenship is really important and I think there's no question about that. But the question we need to ask ourselves is as companies and individuals, what is our approach in creating sustainable development? And really, what is our approach around understanding some of the core issues that affect us as women and as well as society and how do we address that? Unfortunately, you know, it, far too often CSI or CSR projects, I think become more of a tick box exercise. We as corporate, we're more worried about those points. I think we get them, those points that we get every single year when the auditors come. And we're worried about making sure we're moving from level four to level two. And we're no longer doing it because we're trying to see some real value. And, and we're trying to empower people from the core. And I think that's where we are going wrong as corporate in South Africa. We need to really sit and understand what is it that we need to do, not just from the bottom level and from the top, but in management, in middle management, how can we affect the, you know, the uplifting of women in corporate as well as in entrepreneurship and in business as a whole. We cannot expect to move forward as women and as Africans and as Africa and, and move forward and move women forward if we continue to have an attitude that corporate citizenship is about feeling good and a nice to have. I'd like to run us through just a couple of tips that we are currently implementing within our industry or within our business that has not necessarily made huge strides from transformation point of view, but has really set the base in creating a sustainable or a platform and an, and an infrastructure that's solid that will then support our, our socioeconomic development. I think the first key is about listening. If as a business we don't engage with women, how will we really know what the core issues are? And I think we need to stop listening, you know, with ears just to hear, but rather we've got to start listening with an open mind and listening to really understand. Yesterday, uh, one of the speakers mentioned something about um, women in her business not even having, in the lower paying uh, sectors, not even having something as simple as a metric. This took me back. I, I went home last night and I said, oh, you know, here I am. We've got scholarship foundations. We've got interns. We've got, you know, we've got all these great programs. But, you know, I've never thought about creating an initiative as simple as looking at the grassroots issues like a matric certificate. I went back and I challenged my team and I said, how do we challenge ourselves and our suppliers, our clients, our shareholders to look at their lower paying staff and say, do you have a metric? If not, how am I gonna make that happen for you? Because that's the one step forward in creating this, you know, in, in bridging this gender parity. I think listening is gonna help us with four simple things. First, it's going to help us to understand and dissect the issues, the core issues. It's going to, I think, lead to meaningful conversations. I know we here, we're having great meaningful conversations. I know that uh, uh, we, we have these networking sessions outside and we're swapping business cards, but it's in a setting that perhaps we can't make meaningful change. It's time for us to have these conversations in the boardroom. It's time for us to have these conversations when we're setting policies. We've been going on about how women in leadership need to create policies that allow other women to still be women and succeed in their careers. We've been talking about this for years. I was so proud, I think it was Linda yesterday mentioned something about Standard Bank's initiatives where um, as an employee, you can still work at Standard Bank and be an entrepreneur. And I went, wow. And again, I went back to my team and said, let's challenge ourselves and let's challenge our policies and how do we make change within our business so that we can implement these type of initiatives. So it's not only about a salary, it's about creating sustainable growth within our employees so that they can create sustainable growth within their children and the communities that they serve. It's really that simple in my view. I think what listening also will help us do is it will teach us empathy. We sometimes forget that people are human and they've got feelings, they've got families, they've got stories behind them. And empathy, I think, is the heart and soul behind good listening. The other thing that I wanted to say that we've done is we need to start aligning our initiatives, whatever CSI initiatives that we have, to revenue generating activities for our company to create that sustainability. 
We've got to find the nooks and crannies within our businesses that isn't just about taking out, coughing up 100,000 rand, paying for 10 books at a school where we're for girls to go to matric. We can actually start right here at home. And I'll give you an example of what we're doing currently at Ituba to achieve this success. We've expanded our national lottery footprint, not only geographically, but uh, digitally as well. We've just installed, when we started operating, we installed 9,000 um, terminals, fixed terminals, uh, where you can sell lottery tickets from. So when you go to your local store, your shop, right, there's normally that big terminal that you buy your tickets in. We also then took it one step further and integrated with some B2B partners and our alternative sales partners, and we installed over 170,000 handheld terminal devices, which don't necessarily require the technical infrastructure that our big fixed terminals require. And what this then did was it allowed for a revenue to be generated in areas that you know, we couldn't service necessarily. So what we did was we said to women and men around the country, here's a product, we will service you for free, we will give you the product for free, and you will get commission if you have the willpower to be a businessman. And it wasn't about social economic development in the beginning. I think it was, you know, we looked at our strategy and we said, how do we make sales happen? Because at the end of the day, it's about bottom line. I think as the project carried on going, we realized, you know, there's such a big opportunity here to create change. Because the moment somebody who owns a spaza shop or an informal supermarket starts generating a consistent revenue, it's not that one-time big purchase, it's consistent. They start to empower the people around them. It means that they can hire a cashier. It means they can hire two shifts instead of one. It means that we're doing that horizontal growth that we were talking about yesterday. I don't know if anybody stayed towards the end. Well done to the ones who did, by the way. Um, I think those people deserve a round of applause more than the ones that are on stage. I think it's about saying, how do we have a product that we're doing really well in as a national lottery? How do we then give it to other people to make money for themselves? So what we started to see was, the higher our jackpots went, the higher sales were. It's natural. But how do we channel those sales to our smaller partners? Because it's all good that our bigger partners, our chain stores, they're getting the footprint, they're getting the big customers, right? And our poor store, all the way in Tula Mahansh, you know, she's struggling. Then we started saying, okay, let's support our, our stakeholders by driving clientele to their stores. Let's spend some of our marketing, marketing their businesses. Not only our products, but their actual businesses. That way, you've got footfall, and we're increasing that, uh, you know, that consistent revenue that we're talking about. In the last year, we managed to hit several record-breaking jackpots. I'm not so sure if anybody plays. Um, one of which I'm sure we all know about, whether you play or you don't know, or you don't play, but we had the 232 million Rand Powerball jackpot that was hit earlier this year. I personally met the winner. Um, comes from the most humble beginnings I could possibly hope for, I think for, some, for that kind of money. And we said, how do we now take somebody who earned, I think it was less than 5,000 a month, um, and put them in a position where they can manage 232 million rand. I was very proud when I realized that none of my processes needed to change. Because not only did we provide, or do we provide free financial services to anybody who wins over 50,000 rand, but we also provide free trauma and um, emotional psycho psychological counseling. I know it sounds, it sounds ridiculous. Why would I need trauma counseling if I've won 200 million? <laughs> I get the question a lot. Uh, but think about it. Think about it this way. You went to bed, you didn't know how you were going to pay your rent. You didn't know how you were going to pay your kids' school fees. You had debt, you had loans that were sitting up to here. You yourself are physically tired, you're exhausted mentally, you're exhausted emotionally, you're just, you're physically drained. 
You took a luck one day, you decided, oh, here's five rand, seven rand, 50, and I buy a Powerball ticket. I didn't even think I was going to win. I went to bed, though, dreaming that if I won, this is what I'd do with the money. You know, you dream about it. I'll buy a car, I'll, I'll buy a house. And then you wake up and you really realize that you've won 232 million rand. I can guarantee you the five steps you told yourself you were going to follow yesterday are not the five steps that you'll follow today. Because 232 million, even right now for me, must be telling you 100,000 is a lot of money right now. So it was about saying, let's take the infrastructure that we already have. Now with that cycle that I've just mentioned, I've just empowered a psychologist. I don't offer the service to my client at a charge. I pay for that. I've just empowered a financial advisor. I've given them 232 million to invest. Whether they get the business or not, it's not my business anymore because I've given you the opportunity. You need to take it with two hands and run with it. I've got a winner, of course, that we've just empowered. He's got an incredible return on investment. I mean, I think he paid for 30 rand or some ridiculously low amount. Uh, you can't really get any more better in terms of investment when it comes to that. But here we are, we've, got, we've, got, we've just empowered a winner. One of the things that my winner said to me was that he hasn't been able to take his kids to the schools that he wanted to take them to, but nonetheless, he took his children to school, all of them, including his daughter. And I remember saying, all right, well, are you gonna move your kids out of school? Because you wanna live in a, in a different area, you know, how's, how's that going to work? And he says, you know, the last thing I want is my children living their lives knowing that their father is 232 million rand richer. So he kept quiet and he didn't tell anybody except for the rest of the world who's us even though nobody saw his face. But it's all about seeing in those nooks and crannies, where do we then empower people and where do we put our finances where it doesn't necessarily feel big, but nonetheless, there's a huge ripple effect there on. So we accomplish some of our strategic uh, agendas through the contributions we make not only through the NLDTF, but also through our winners and our products and, 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 and the selling of our products. The next thing I want to talk about, sorry, <clears throat> is relevance. Listening keeps you relevant. Um, when I say listening, it's also about, you know, maybe going on your phone and reading uh, the news. It's about digesting information. But listening keeps you relevant. I spoke about my mother, the co-founder of Zamani and the group CEO, um, and her story. I think it's, it's relevant for me to share her story so that we could all sort of understand the background. My mother comes from KZN. She is the oldest daughter of four children. She was raised by a single mother, like most women in this room probably might have been. Um, she finished only matric. She doesn't have an education further than that, but it definitely didn't stop her. She left her education as a last priority because her first was to take her siblings to school. And in order to do that, she needed to make money. And in order to do that, she needed to get a job. And at the time, school just did not give you money. You don't get paid to go to school. I mean, I wish you did. In fact, maybe we should add that to the... To the <laughs> You know, she left school, she started looking after her siblings, all of which right now are sitting with not only degrees, but most of them are sitting with postgrads like honors and masters. So I'm extremely proud. Even though she doesn't herself have a tertiary education, her siblings are sitting privileged with degrees. I think her experience really speaks to the sacrifice that women make on a daily basis. And I think even though we sit in platforms like this and we celebrate each other, um, we celebrate people we don't even know. I think it's time for us to turn around and celebrate our mothers, our sisters, our friends, the people right around us. Yesterday I said hashtag the girls club. I'm starting that movement. I'm telling you now, it is going to be something that's going to work. Hashtag the girls club. We need to say we need to be equal with this boys club. We've got to compete with them. And the only way we can do that is if we start uplifting each other. And I think the way that we can start is just by being relevant, sharing each other's stories and then gaining strength from those stories. I think 
this is something we mentioned and we spoke about yesterday. It is not enough to simply put a budget behind something if there's no intention. We've got a scholarship foundation that's taken several kids to school, um, both male and female. And I said yesterday that we do not expect monetary repayment from any of our scholars. The only thing we expect back is for you to pay it forward. You need to take a sister, a cousin, a neighbor to school and show us that that's how you've done it and that's how we pay each other back. There is no point in as corporate, we give each other scholarships and the moment you graduate, you already owe me money. You already have debt. I gave you an opportunity to better yourself, but the moment you did, I also put you in a situation that not only kills you, but it creates a liability for yourself. I think today we've got to challenge corporates in South Africa and globally to follow a same model. To say if we're going to give, we're going to give wholeheartedly and we're going to do it because we want to create sustainability. We're not doing it to create a tick box solution. We're not doing it to look good and accolades and we're not doing it so we can post pictures on social media and our website. We've been talking about getting involved. Women need to voice themselves. If they've got something to say, they need to speak about it. I think that in order for women to get involved, I think we need to have a little bit more courage. And the only way we can have courage is if we've got fear. I think you can't be brave without fear. It's a statement that um, I've heard many, many times. And I think as a young girl, I never really understood it until one day I had to stand up on stage and give an address and I was so scared, I was shaking and it wasn't cold, in the, it wasn't even inside, it was outside. I was shaking out of fear. And I got up and I don't remember my speech. I just spoke and then I got off and I went and sat down. And at the end, my dad said, oh, you know, you did so well. Oh, Kenzie, you did so well. And I said, no, I didn't. I did terribly, I don't even remember what I said, so how does everybody else remember what I said? He said, the fact that you were so scared to get up on stage and say something, and you did anyway, and you didn't care what people said about you, or what they felt, and if you walked out this room and they said, oh, that girl sucked, so what? The fact that you did that, in my eyes, you did the best. So I think we need to be more courageous as women and we need to embrace our fear. We spoke about embracing our vulnerabilities yesterday, and we said some of those vulnerabilities are about failure. We've got to be okay with failing or mistakes. <laughs> it's part of life. I think there's a great uh, uh, um, quote that I would like to add or what I'd like to share with you. And it's really about what happens when you empower women. When you empower women, you're investing in good governance, economic growth, I think it's poverty eradication, ending hunger, and achieving food security and nutrition. It doesn't sound like these things affect business, but think of a child who goes to school hungry. I don't wanna go into this conversation necessarily because I think we've all heard about it, but there are some core basic things that need to first be achieved before we can start saying we're achieving them on the higher levels. We as women, not necessarily the ones sitting in this room. I'm talking about the women who aren't as privileged, I'll, I'll, I'll use that word carefully. We as women don't see that there are women out there who are starving and hungry, but they are still hustling. And it's funny that if our neighbor is hungry and our neighbor's child is hungry, we still make an effort to feed a child that doesn't even belong to us again speaking to the sacrifice that women are willing to make. And it just says that the more we empower ourselves, the more we really do empower a nation. It isn't just a saying. We really do, as women, take it upon ourselves to look after each other. But why can't we do that in business when it really matters? So we then decided, as a family, I think it's important for me to raise that. As a family, we decided that we've been in business for a long time and we've got other family members within our company that have served with us for more than 10 years. 
How do we reward that kind of loyalty? Bonuses, maybe. Um, a trip away, a holiday, maybe. Christmas, lunch, maybe. A staff party, maybe. And we said, let's sit with our staff. I just mentioned point one was listening. Let's sit with our staff. Let's talk to them about what are some of the needs that they have. And we identified that the basic need of housing was still an issue within our organization, even though we've tried very hard to develop our staff. So last year, we took the bold step of building 10 homes for 10 of our staff members that have served over 10 years. We didn't just build the homes, because I'm talking about sustainability. I can't just give you a house, give you keys, and then say, go ahead, right? We talk about um, lottery winners all the time. Internationally, when we have these big conferences, you see, uh, especially in the US, uh, these lottery winners buying massive mansions and fast cars, and then 10 years later, the insurance on that car is so expensive you can't afford it anymore. The maintenance on your home is eating up all of your lottery money. You can't do anything with it. It all goes back to sustainability. So we said, okay, let's work with the women in the community because the women we know will help us keep that sustainability. I'm not putting down men. I'm just saying that we knew that the women would help us here. So we ventured on in building a village. And let me tell you, we built this village in what? 60 days. 60 days it took us to build 10 houses, four bedroom houses. And it was with thanks to women. We planted grass, we builded fences, we washed windows. We, there was nothing that we didn't do. Yes, we had contractors, but it was us. It was us as women who really helped put this project together. And I could not be more proud of the community that um, this home is in. It's an actual sort of mini estate. And they've got all the amenities there to sustain their own lives, like a garden. I think they, they are allowed to you know, build their own businesses within the village. And it really is about saying, how can we help you keep this establishment? You've got it now, but we need to help you keep it. Now I've talked about what we're doing on the higher level, but I think we need to keep going back down to grassroots. I was really touched, by the way, about the matric stats yesterday. And I found it you know, quite ironic because the biggest thing I wanted to talk about today was educating girl children. I know we, we, we have this gender parity discussion and um, I'm not putting down the, the boy child at all, but I think in addressing some of the issues that we have, we've got to acknowledge that there is a massive gap at the moment between our boy child and our girl child, and it starts at home. Um, when I was young, don't tell my mom, I hated doing the dishes. I hated doing the dishes. And I think it wasn't because of the, I don't think it was about the actual physical labor of doing dishes. I think it was about the fact that every time I had to do the dishes, it was because Goko said, that's what girls have to do. You know? And I was like, why can't my, there's five of them. You know, like, we eat like 10% of the food in this house. You guys eat everything else. You make these, you, you made us make these dishes and yet I need to be the one to wash them, you know? I hated doing dishes. So I made a deal with my brother because he hated sweeping the, the corridors outside, you know, the stoop, he hated that. And I hated dishes. So I said, okay, let's make a deal. You'll do all the dishes and I'll do all of your jobs outside for one day, but you have to make sure that mom and dad see us. Because we're gonna do such a good a job at each other's roles that they definitely gonna have to stay that way. It's gonna be permanent, right? Mom's gonna say, you have to do the dishes now, Eric, and I'm gonna be doing his work outside. And his work outside was ridiculously much easier or less labor intensive than mine. Needless to say, I'm still washing dishes. And he's still cleaning outside because you know what? <laughs> it didn't work out the way that we did. Because in our household at that time, girls were still supposed to be doing girl jobs. 
And in my household, unfortunately for my partner, it's no longer that case. And it is really about how do we change discussions within our house. This is an interesting fact. Um, I think it was Global Giving released a report that said an extra year of education can help a girl earn between 15 and 25% more as an adult. And if she completes secondary school, she's six times less likely to become a child bride. First of all, the fact that we need to know this type of statistic is scary. You don't hear about incidences that male or boy child, if they can finish secondary school, they're six times less likely to become you know, a child groom. I don't know if that's what we call them. I think it's scary that these are some of the realities that we have in society and it's scary that we need to talk about how something as simple as one year additional education can help give you 25% more on a job that you're already earning over 50% less than your male counterpart. As corporate, we took a bold stance to say we're not going to continue the trend of unequal pay at Zamani. Not when we're led by a woman. And that's exactly what we did. Equal pay for men and women doing the same job. It's just how it is. <clears throat> but it took someone to make a decision. It didn't take us talking about it and complaining about it. It took someone saying, no, I will not tolerate this. If Kinsani is earning one rand an hour, Tabo is earning one rand an hour. If, she's, if they're doing the same job, then that's how it's going to be. And Tabo, if you don't want to work here, great. Let's find another Kinsani and we'll have two of them. It's just that simple. I know that we, we, in different industries, we've got different limitations. And I'm not trying to say, go out there and go knock on your boss's door and say, if you don't pay me the same, I'm leaving. I'm saying that in the position that you're in, you have some sort of power. When you are hiring, why would you look at Kinsani's payslip and say it's 15,000 and then look at Tabo's and see 25,000 and then sign off on that? I think we need to start making changes, even if it's small, within our own spaces. So in educating a girl child, I think we can start empowering them with these type of conversations and giving them the courage to say no when they need to say no. If we're talking about upskilling, um, I think we can, I'll go to this beautiful photo here. These are my 2019 interns, um, all of which started in September last year. I think it, it does seem a little bit weird, there's lots of male faces there, but um, what I'm more proud of really is about the number of women I have currently designated in ICT positions as interns. I've got over 50% of my interns that are women working in ICT. The positions that are available within our company at the moment or at the time that we were doing this was in marketing, ICT, corporate relations, projects and finance. And we struggled at, with the concept, I think it was a mind thing, we struggled to understand why would women want to do this ICT thing, we're putting way too many numbers behind there. And when we put the applications out there, ICT was the first position to get filled by women. In fact, we sat there and said, hey, doesn't this look a bit weird? You know, shouldn't we have a little bit of a mix? And we, you know, we put a boy child in there. But really, I'm very, very proud of the fact that we've got strong women in ICT who are staying with us because they are graduating through our internship program. So I'm extremely proud of that. I want to talk about two initiatives um, before I wrap up that we're currently doing. The first, we spoke about how we're empowering our retailers by just giving them a product absolutely free of charge. But we took it a bit step further. We took 65 of our, sorry, 65 of our retail women 
through a program to help them build their own businesses. Um, this is above and beyond the marketing that we give. This is to say, you're already doing something for yourself. It had nothing to do with me as a lottery operator. How can I make the business that you are doing for yourself without me better? So we currently have 65 women who are uh, about to graduate with, I think it's NQF level five certificates. Um, and their businesses have not only, in some cases, we've seen over 50% increase in sales. So that's phenomenal. Um, and I think we're going to be continuing this year with our uh, retailer development program. And we're extremely proud to be holding that. Um, we've also got a newly launched project that I can't wait to announce um, formally. Our supply development initiative um, through an incubator, which we're starting this year. We took a list of our um, major um, or um, at least 51% black owned businesses and said, how do we now uh, create bigger business for you and how do we use our network to grow your business? And then how do we give you the scaffolding to support yourself through that program? Before I end off, um, I want to just end with one more value that I think we need to discuss. We have got to give women back their dignity. In so many societies, especially in developing economies, we face, women face endless cycles of abuse, whether it's domestic, sexual, in the workplace, bullying. We, we accept and deal with a lot of trauma on a day-to-day -day basis even if that trauma is caused by ourselves. We as women need to give our dignity back to each other and I think it starts with ourselves. It starts with ourselves giving each other back that support and driving the hashtag girls club. In my closing remarks, I think sustainability has been the key word that you know, I've been preaching for the last two days. I really think that it's important for business to not just want to create a difference in socioeconomic development, but to say, how do we grow horizontally? We mentioned this. We said, how do we spread the wealth this way and not this way? How do we influence procurement? How do we influence enterprise development programs within corporate? And how do we support entrepreneurship as corporate? How do we stop seeing them as threats and competition and start seeing them as resources and partners? I'd like to close off with a very good story um, that our HR manager told us. I don't know if everyone knows you know, Mahatma Gandhi. I hope you do. Um, he takes a daily trip or a weekly trip to the grocery store with his son who drives the, uh, and, and they drive in a car. They get to the groceries and they do everything but you know, Gandhi says, listen, the car's been giving me troubles. I just need you to take the car, speaking to his son, to go get it fixed at such and such house. When you're done, let's meet back here at two o'clock on the dot. I'll meet you right here. The son goes his way. Gandhi keeps going and shopping for the house. At two o'clock, Gandhi meets him exactly where he was, and his son is not there. He starts to panic a little bit, asking people, has anyone seen my son? He eventually goes to the mechanic's house. Nobody's seen him. In fact, the mechanic says, well, that guy left hours and hours ago. They are phoning everybody. They're trying to locate the son and nobody can find him. Eight o'clock in the evening, Gandhi goes back to the same place where he said he'll meet his son and Lord behold, there's the man sitting there in his car. Gandhi gets in and says, where were you? And the son goes, oh no, dad, you know, I took the car to get fixed, but it took a lot longer than I thought. I'm only really getting back now. All right, he keeps quiet. He says, all right, let me drive. Gandhi gets into the driver's seat and drives down a road back to the village. It's quiet and there's no other cars. He stops on the side, gets out the car and says, son, you are now going to drive. And the son says, why dad, is something wrong? Is it, are you okay, are you feeling sick? And he says, no, I'm going to take the next part of the journey home alone by foot. I'm going to walk home because I need time to reflect on what is it that I did so wrong that my only son would lie to me. It all comes back to you. And I think we need to remember that. Thank you.